Hello, good evening and welcome. Here we go again. This is The Late Show. It's the 11th of November 2020. Time is really flying and we're back again. Me and my, sir, my son Jack. Evening, Jack. Good evening. You all right, mate? You all good? I'm exhausted tonight, but hopefully it'll still be a good show. We've got a good topic lined up. Yeah, good on you, mate. Good on you. We have got a good topic. Never heard it preached on, I don't think, for a long time. Very, very long time. And as we're in such dark times, uh, we thought tonight that we would address the issue of Jesus basically talking about being the light of the world. What is the light? Who is the light? What does it mean? Why is it important? Why do we need the light of the world? Why does the world hate the light, etc., etc.? It is a live and interactive show. Um, so email us in live at revelationtv.com and text in on 07860 799 and uh, we'll do our best to get you through and uh, and get you all read out try and keep it roughly within the confines of the uh, of the actual title of the show um, obviously we'll read out most stuff but uh, try and keep it roughly uh, in bounds there jack you've been preparing quite quite a lot for this and you've just started a, a new job haven't you so you're you're I like to spread out my preparation normally i just do it all on the day yeah i planned ahead and did a bit on monday but on tuesday a bit on wednesday yeah and yeah but also i've been reading the Gospel of John in my own time and with a Bible study group we've been going through one John and light kept coming up all the time in both of them. John is very distinct in how he writes, he always writes about light and life and love, he stands out, he, he's my favourite Gospel writer, I really like yeah. John. Yeah. So I thought well because I keep reading about light why don't I just talk about it as well. Yeah. Actually, you saw the light this week, didn't you? You made me and mum a cup of tea yesterday afternoon. Yeah, it was quite <laughs> shocking, wasn't it? We, we actually was quite shocked. So, yes, that is now sorted out. <laughs> really nice cup of tea. Jack, first part of the subject is uh, Jesus is the light. And he, he declared himself to be the light of the world, didn't he? Yeah. And uh, so what did you get out of the fact that Jesus is the light? Well, that's actually a major claim. And with so many of these biblical statements, especially if we're brought up in church, we can kind of go, oh, yeah, we know Jesus is the light. But if someone came up to me and said, I am the light of the world, I think, well, you love yourself, don't you? <laughs> and because it's such a big claim, you're basically saying you're number one. Yeah. You're this bringer of truth and holiness. And but with Jesus, he says it and he meant it. He wasn't crazy. And he had witnesses to back it up. And in John 8, verse 12, he says it, I am the light of the world. And he says, the light only one. He doesn't say one amongst many. You know, some people claim to be some really spiritual people and set up their own cults and they might say, oh, I'm just one holy man, but there are other truths in different religions and this. But he says he is the light of the world. He is number one. He is the beacon of truth and holiness in this world. And it's also a claim of deity. Only God can be the light of the world. And that's clear. And even in 1 John, he writes about this in his gospel and in his epistles. He says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And darkness in the scriptures is mentioned a lot, not just with John, but all throughout the Bible. I think of Paul writing in Ephesians 6 about uh, overcoming the darkness. And it's basically saying that God hates sin. He has nothing to do with sin. Sin doesn't dwell in him. In him, there is no darkness at all. Yeah. God is completely pure and holy, not like the world. Um, it says God is light, and in the gospel it says Jesus is the light. Yeah. So Jesus is making a claim of being God. And I said a minute ago that there are witnesses for this because the Pharisees basically came to Jesus and said, well, your word isn't good enough. What evidence have you got? And Jesus had a few different witnesses. And uh, number one, in John 8 verse 18, Jesus says, the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And I was thinking to myself, in what way does the Father bear witness? And there are a few occasions when God the Father actually speaks out of heaven. And one example is at Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit comes upon him as a dove, and God the Father says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. So we see the Trinity all in one passage. So God speaks, and on other times as well, when, the, um, when they're at the Transfiguration, God, the Father says, this is my son, listen to him. And I think there might be one or two other occasions as well where he speaks audibly, which is very rare for God the Father. We know Jesus came to earth and, and was on the earth for over 30 years. And also, 
God the Father speaks to us by the resurrection. That's how he's a witness, because it says that God raised him up from the dead. So if Jesus was a false prophet, he'd still be dead in the grave, and that would have been the end of the story. So we've got the Father speaking audibly by the resurrection, and also by the Old Testament scriptures, and they're kind of their own category as well. And Jesus says um, to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And the Pharisees claimed to love Moses, to love the law. They thought they were holy and obeyed the law and were righteous men. But Jesus said, if you really love Moses and if you really love the scriptures, you would love me because it all speaks about me. And there are quite a lot of passages that say the same thing. Um, I chose that one, but it says that Moses speaks about him. That's the first five books. It talks about the, the law, the same. It talks about the prophets. It, it talks about the Psalms, all speaking about Jesus. It covers the whole Old Testament. It was all pointing to the coming Messiah, wow. which is Jesus. So we've got the Father, we've got the Scriptures, and Jesus also says his works bear witness. He says, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And at one stage, Jesus said, if you don't believe me, believe the works that I do, didn't he? Exactly. And wh one of the big claims he makes is that he's not just a normal man, but he's actually come from heaven. Mm. And he says, the Father has sent me. And the Pharisees hated this claim. They said, you're claiming to be this, you know, the number one, the life from heaven. Get over yourself. But Jesus was doing miracles. You know, he turned water into wine. He fed the 5,000. He even raised people from the dead. So Jesus did miracles where even on the cross, he, the, one of the uh, Romans says, well, truly this was the Son of God. He had a revelation and the Pharisees had no excuse. They should have seen that in his works, all these miracles that he did. And we've been talking this week a bit about spiritual gifts together. And one of the, well, the apostles to verify their message, to show they weren't just making it up, they could do miracles and they could do healings and these amazing things. And it's the same with Jesus. He did all these amazing wonders to show that he truly was the Messiah. And one last witness I'll mention is John the Baptist. And he says some wonderful things about Jesus. He doesn't live very long. He gets killed very early. But starting in verse 29 of John chapter 1, um, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptising with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptise with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptises with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So John the Baptist really knew who Jesus was. Yeah. And he actually claims there that God spoke to him, told him to go baptising. And if you've ever wondered why John was baptising with water, because no one else was really doing it, it was basically to draw people to the coming Messiah. John knew he was coming. That's why it says in the Old Testament, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And it says in the Gospels that that was John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord. Yeah. And it says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And there is that famous story of Charles Spurgeon when he was just, I think maybe the day before he gave a sermon or maybe that day he was just on his own and there was a cleaner and he's just practicing his speaking. And he, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this cleaner who wasn't a Christian was so convicted I think there and then he gave his life to Christ. Wow. But I think that's such a powerful verse. Like, yep. And we, we read so many behold statements, but behold, he's saying, look, behold, look, yeah. this is Open the lamb. Open your eyes, yep. And for, especially for a Jew, you knew a lamb that was the sacrificial animal. Yeah. This Jesus, right in the first chapter, before we know too much about him, this Jesus would be sacrificed. Why? To take away the sins of the world. So. I really love John the Baptist because he had such a revelation. And there's so much you could say about John the Baptist. Maybe we should do a show on him one day. Yeah. Um, that's an introduction to Jesus as the light. Brilliant. And they're the witnesses that and bear. Isn't it great? The Old Testament sacrifices, the lambs used to cover the sin. But Jesus does what? He takes it away.
what a different world. And that sets us truly free. Mm. You know, Jack, I had a revelation last night, uh, thanks to um, that little book I'm reading, you know, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, um, Messianic Christ Christology. Thanks to Derek Walker, who gave me a copy of, he got two, two copies of that. Thank you, Derek. I'm, I'm about 56 pages in there, absolutely dev devouring it every night. And I had an absolute revelation, thanks to Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Jack, can you turn to Zechariah 13, verse 7? Give me a few seconds to find that. If you've got a Bible at home, Zechariah 13, verse 7, because a moment ago, Jack, um, you were talking about saying that God is light, okay, and only God can be light. And Jesus turns up and says, I am the light of the world. And I want to see what, what you've got. Have you got the English Standard Version? Yeah. Just, I'm interested in what yours is going to say. I've got the New King James. And do you know what, guys? It's sometimes an absolute revelation and a real blessing to look into other versions and to look into more literal translations. And Zach, Jack, uh, 13 verse seven, this is, talk, this is God talking about the shepherd saviour who was to be Jesus. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, that's the Lord, against the man, capital M, who is my, and in my version it says, is my companion. Some versions say associate. Mine says against the man who stands next to me. Stands next to me. Right. The literal Hebrew, Jack, of stands next to me or companion, it's in the, in the Hebrew it says, against the man who is my, this is a claim to deity, who is my equal. Now, the, the translators obviously had trouble with that one because that's too close to the bone, but that is a literal translation. He's, God is saying that Jesus, the shepherd saviour to come, is his equal. That is why Jesus can be the light of the world because yeah. he is God in human flesh. How about that, you know? And the Pharisees knew Jesus was saying that because they yeah. go to stone him and they, they go say, to stone you him, being don't they? a man, make yourself equal with God. Equal with God, They yeah. weren't happy about it, but that was the truth. Yeah, absolutely brilliant stuff. So um, thank you, Derek. Great, one of the best books I've ever read. Absolutely great. Point two, Jack, and this one is very manifest now. Uh, it's always been manifest, but I, well, maybe, maybe I'm over-egging it a bit. Uh, you know, obviously I've only lived in this era. I can't, I can only be in one era at a time. Um, the world hates the light. And I'm starting to get a real sense with that, Jack, now. But obviously there's been other times, you know, all, all throughout history, the world has hated the light. And it always will. The unregenerate heart can do nothing but. The world hates the light, Jack. How is that manifesting now in these days? What do you see out there as you, as you look out? Well, I guess you're right in a sense that the hatred of the light manifests itself in different ways. Because John MacArthur put it very nicely. He says, God has put systems in place to limit our sin. One of them is government. One of them is family. Um, and there are other social structures as well. I can't remember which ones he names. But especially with... Marriage? Uh, that comes under family. I think. Okay, yep, yeah, no worries. Um, but especially with the breakdown of marriage and the family, at least in the West, that has allowed more sin. And with so many unrighteous rulers, that has allowed more sin. So I think it, there is um, fluctuation, even though we're always sinners, but how much we're allowed to release that is based on social structures to an extent. Yeah. But we read in John chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. And a lot of people wonder, especially if they've been evangelising someone for so long, why do they resist? And this helps us to understand, number one, because they love their sin. They love darkness rather than the light. And number two, they don't want the light to expose their sin. You know, they want to have the idea that they're a righteous person and they're a good person, but the Bible says none is good, no, not one. So there are two big reasons why people resist the gospel. And in John chapter 7, verse 7, similar thing, it says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it, that its works are evil. And if you ask a lot of people today, do you like Christianity? They'll say, oh, no, I, no, I hate Christianity, I hate religion. And if, if you ask, do you like Jesus? A lot of people actually say, yeah, I like Jesus, he was a nice guy. Yeah. Well, actually, if they met the real Jesus, they'd probably hate him because he declared to people that their works were evil. 
and no one wants to hear that. You know, everyone wants to think they're a good person, that they're nice. And especially if you watch, you know, Ray Comfort evangelising, he always says, so do you think you're a good person? And 95% of people say yes. And by the end of it, they realise they're not, and they realise they need a saviour. But Jesus exposed people's works. He exposes our sin. And that is a good thing, because you can't receive forgiveness and submit to God until you realise you're a sinner in need of forgiveness. But Jesus Christ came to save sinners, so that is the good news. It is, Jack. On the other hand, for Christians, it's different. In John chapter 3, verse 21, it says, But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And obviously we're all sinners, and at one point we were all unsaved. But when you become a believer, and all your sins are completely washed away, and you've been made completely righteous in your standing, we were listening in the car, weren't we, to Zach Poon, and he was reminding us how we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. And to be justified means to be declared righteous. Now we're fully righteous, that will work itself out to an extent in our works. And we still sin, but in 1 Corinthians, it talks about, some people think this is talking about purgatory or something, but it's actually, I'll, I'll read the verse and explain it. It says, if the work that anyone has built on, the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. So if you build works based on Christ, based on the truth, they have an eternal value. If you sit around all day just playing PlayStation as a Christian, you're not going to get rewarded in that for heaven. And there's nothing wrong with playing PlayStation, but Paul is encouraging us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 to do works for the Lord, to do things that have an eternal value. And that's not just evangelism, but that's being a good parent, being a good child, being a good friend, loving people, being sacrificial in your love. Um, so he's really encouraging us there. But for believers, we want these works to be seen by the Lord so that we can have our reward in heaven. I like it. And Jesus says, you know, don't let your right hand see what your left hand is doing. We don't want our praise on earth. We want to get to heaven and the Lord say, I know what you did in the secret place. Here's my reward for you. Amen, Jack. A little bit earlier on, you said about people don't like to come to the light because um, it exposes their, their bad deeds, you know. And I want to encourage anyone out there that um, no matter what you've been through, no matter what, what sort of life you've led, and everyone has a past, and as Jack said, the Bible says uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. Jesus wants to uh, assure you now that whatever shame and disgrace you may feel, he bore it, okay? In Isaiah 50, um, verse 7, so Isaiah, around 700 years before the actual birth of Christ, um, a prophecy that the, the Lord Jesus says in verse 7, for the Lord God will help me, He's talking about his crucifixion and his redemption, which is to come 700 years later for the lord god will help me the lord says therefore i will not be disgraced if you're worried about disgrace and shame the lord takes it for you therefore i will not be disgraced therefore i've set my face like flint and i know that i will not be ashamed and we can we can be certain okay that the disgrace that we carried all right the shame that we felt it all gets wiped away okay 2 corinthians 5:17 that old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You can literally, literally be free. Be totally free of all your past uh, feelings, past misadventures, past sin. The freedom that Christ offers is all encompassing, encompassing Jack, isn't it? And it's a full freedom. That's why Galatians talks about, you know, stand therefore in the freedom by which Christ has set us free. It's very easy to... I'm talking, if I'm not talking to anyone here, I'm talking to myself. It's very easy to phase back, Jack, into like a, a legalistic and a, a religi religiosity sort of based salvation that we, we've always got to do something to keep ourselves, you know, earning God's love and earning God's keeping power and earning God's salvation. Very easy to fall back in that. But the freedom that Christ gives us is very all encompassing, isn't it, Jack? Mm. You know, it's, it is amazing. Good stuff. Should we go to number three? Yes, so the third point is that we are light. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, it says, You are the light of the world. And he's talking to us here, Jesus talking to us. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works 
and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Some people say, oh, I am a Christian, but my faith is private. I don't like speaking about it. Mm. And I think, that's so selfish. <laughs> You've got the good news that saves people from eternal punishment and they can have eternal life and they can come to know God and you just want to keep it to yourself. I mean, that's actually wrong. Um, and it's quite possibly a sign that they're not actually a Christian. But here it says, let your light shine before others. We should have a public faith. It should be evident that we're Christians, but not just in what we say and not just in our preaching. It says so that they may see your good works. And I've just recently started a job and I was just thinking, I want to be a witness in the workplace. And I won't always get the chance to speak to people about the gospel, especially if people are busy at work, but just by my actions, by the things I don't do, by the things I do, I want people to see that this person is a Christian and I want my light to shine before others. And I was thinking, well, if Jesus is the light, that suggests there's only one. Mm. So how can we be light as well? And I think a good example is the sun and the moon. And we're like the moon. We do have light, but it's not actually from ourselves. We simply reflect it from the sun. And it's the same. Jesus is the light. He shines onto us. We behold his face and it shines onto us and we can reflect it as well. That's all we do. That's how it should be. And so to, to be a light, we should be like Christ because he is the light. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That's Paul speaking. Paul was trying to be like Christ. And he's saying, be like me in, in trying to be like Christ. That's our aim, to become more and more like Jesus every day. And in Romans 8, verse 29, it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And we've done a show on predestination and election. And um, one of the big emphases in predestination is to become like Jesus. And before the foundation of the world, God decided that all who believe in his son will become like his son. That's what we predestined to, to be holy and blameless and righteous and righteous in his sight like Jesus and right now that's true for our standing we've been declared righteous gradually over time we become more and more righteous in our acts but eventually Jesus will return and make us fully righteous in our acts when we receive our new bodies and we're finally released from these bodies of sin yeah I like that Jack and often I'll say it every week because I, I, basically it's, it's, it's my situation um, you can only work out of yourself, what has been put into yourself, you know? And so don't resort to uh, works of the flesh and works of the carnal mind to try and be more holy, more righteous, more etc. Et because you're onto a loser, okay? So allow the Lord by his spirit to work himself into you and then allow that outworking to come, to, to come by the Holy Spirit and to work yourself out, work Christ out in your life. Um, it's almost like a natural response, isn't it? You, so you can only work out what you've allowed to be put in. So don't set yourself up for a fall every day, trying to, uh, you know, trying to be Mr. and Mrs. Holy uh, of your own, out of your own flesh, because you'll set yourself up for a fall. But the closer you walk to the Lord, you won't be able to do anything but help reflect him and be like him, and you will work him out, you know? Yeah. Um, do you know what, Jack? So, and obviously, it's a bit harder for you to answer this because you're only 23. Um, Sometimes, Jack, you get to sort of my age and you think to yourself, oh, you know, I let myself down yesterday. I'm, that wasn't very Christ-like and this, that and the other. And, you know, you, often you get to the stage where you think, oh, I should be a bit further down the road than this, you know. You, you, won't, you won't understand this. I'm presuming you won't understand this yet because you, you've only been a Christian about 10 minutes. Um, well, about 15. Um, but, yeah, do you know what? Any advice, Jack? I'm, I'm going to put you into the, the hot seat here. Any advice for people that have that sort of feeling, even though you probably haven't experienced it yourself yet? Or have you? Maybe I'm putting words in your own mouth. Where you feel like, oh, hang on a minute, I'm not as far down the road as, as I was thinking. Well, I mean, if you've got any self-awareness at all, you realise that you're not perfect and you make mistakes. And um, one thing is, like I was moaning at you the other day, when, yesterday actually, my dad's got a habit of whenever he's comfy, no one to move. If I come in just for a quick chat, or so even just for a minute, just for a break from work, he'll always say, can you take that out? Or can you get me a tea? Or can you get me a chocolate biscuit or something? <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm not your slave, you know, you, you are allowed to use your legs. But then often what happens is 
You know, I said, oh, stop winding me up all the time. You go out and then you just got that voice saying, just go and do it. <laughs> and uh, obviously, like, you get bigger examples of that. I don't go away feeling really bad because I didn't go and get you a tea or something. But, um, but you do take the mix sometimes. But, uh, you know, I, I, I do think of Jesus where he, he became a servant. Yeah. You know, he said, I have not come to serve, but to be served. And you really see me as a servant sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, if Jesus can become a servant, how much more can we? Absolutely. So, yeah. um, <laughs> definitely, if you've got some self-awareness. But at the same time, Paul says, I think in 1 Corinthians, I might be wrong. He says, I, I don't judge others and I don't even judge myself. And there is a book called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. And he's basically saying what Paul says where actually we don't need to judge ourselves thinking, oh, have I been righteous enough today? Am I a good enough Christian? Because if our focus is always on ourselves, yeah. we're never going to reach this standard. And the point of the law was to put loads of laws in place, 613, and when you've got all these laws, inevitably you'll fail. And that God wanted you to see your failure so that you would give up. And if you're still trying to be a good person to get faith with God, just give up because you won't be able to do it. You'll set yourself up for failure. The more rules you have, it's just the more rules you've broken. So get to the point where you say, you know what? I'm not a good person. I am a sinner and it must be completely God's righteousness given to me that makes me righteous. So then you don't need to judge yourself because if you judge yourself, you'll just feel condemned because there's nothing in you that deserves God's favour. So look to Christ, let him be your motivation and we're not sanctified by consistently judging ourselves, saying today 7 out of 10, and then tomorrow 7.1. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus is praying to the Father for his disciples, and he says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So if we want to be sanctified, set apart for God, and we want to become more like Christ, then we need to be in the truth. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So be stuck in the word, be thinking about Christ, put your eyes on him, and you'll become more like him. And it's like with driving. You said to me the other day, you know, if you're looking at something, people will gradually move towards it. Yeah, your hands follow your eyes. And it is the same in our spiritual walk. If we're looking to Christ, we'll start moving towards Christ and becoming more like him. Yeah. But it's a process. I've got friends who take the mick out of me because on one show I said, I want to be holier and quicker. And they, they caught on to that and thought that was funny. But it is true. Yeah. We're not where we should be, but we don't need to keep judging ourselves, just Love focus it. on Christ. Keep our eyes on him. Nice one, Jack. Evening to you both. At last, back to words of the Bible. I thought all that we can hear about Trump, listen, we're going to keep hearing about Trump for a little while longer yet. Um, it is big news. I can count on you both to talk about our Lord. God bless from N. Thank you, N. Brilliant stuff. Jack, slightly out of the ballpark here. Hello, Mark and Jack. If God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and is outside of time omnipresent, why is there a need for angels if God can do all that angels can do and a lot more? Now, you said you like little questions out the, outside the ballpark sometimes. Any idea? Why does God use angels, Jack? James White puts it in a good way, the theologian in America. He says God uses means. And if I make a cake, no one's going to say, oh, it was really the cake mixer that made the cake, or it was really the spoon that made the cake or the oven. No, I made a cake, I've just used means. And it's the same with God. For him to achieve his purposes, he could just click his fingers or just say it and it will be. It's like with creation. Jesus is the word, the word was spoken, and the world and the universe came into being. But in some things, God decides to use means. It's like evangelism. He doesn't need to use people. The Bible says even the rocks could declare the glory of God if, if that's what God wanted. But he uses people, he uses Christians. That's how he spreads his kingdom doesn't have to, but he chooses to involve us in his glory. And he uses angels as well. The book of Hebrews calls angels ministering spirits. And the word angel means messenger. So in order to speak to people at certain times, God uses messengers, angels, like with Abraham when he sees three angels, and one of them is Jesus, in my opinion. Um, so God decides to because he can. It's one of his means, of a, means to an end, isn't it? Yeah. All right, that. hope that's some sort of answer for you. Brilliant. I never had that answer. Andy from Coventry. Evening all. Before the fall, the light bearer, I believe, was Lucifer. Then he rebelled and was cast down from heaven. So God then made Jesus the light, sent him to us to show us the light to lead the way. 
Jack is a credit to you, Mark. God bless Andy from Coventry. Thanks, Andy. Good stuff. Absolutely good stuff. And Catherine, part one of two is missing. Ah, right, OK. Catherine, I've only got the very last few words of your, or your text, and that hopefully... Um, Right, hopefully we'll find that in a moment. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, did Jesus say that his followers are also the light of the world? Thanks, Anne. Yeah, so like I've already said, we are light. And so anyone who follows Jesus is light. But not that we've got light in ourselves. We only reflect Jesus' light. Yeah. That's, that's uh, even though I've, I've come up with the idea of the sun and the moon, the Bible doesn't say that. Yeah. But that's the principle there. Because we have nothing good in and of ourselves. We can only reflect Jesus. Amen. And that's also why um, the Bible says we can't boast. And it says every good gift is from God. Mm. So anything good we have, we can just say, thank you, Lord, or praise be to God. And, you know, I can't go around saying, oh, I'm so glad I can do this. Yeah. Because I can only do it because God's enabled me to do it. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Exactly. He said, absolutely nothing. Um, OK, I love to remember the transfiguration of Christ that showed the disciples exactly who he is. They must have been astonished and it must have made a huge impact on understanding when Jesus said that he was the light. I looked up Chambers Dictionary and it never mentions light as a capitalised thing. To man it is only a thing, not a person, just like the world's understanding. Jesus is mainly to the world, world a thing and not a person. Thank God we have him, H-I-M, in capitals. I think that's from Susan. Thanks, Susan. And God does that a lot in the Bible. He takes a thing and it says this is a person. Like, with the idea of, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, that was an idea in Greek philosophy, and they talk about the Word as an abstract concept. And actually, God says, no, the Word is Jesus. Mm. And even in is it Proverbs 8, it talks about wisdom, and it makes wisdom a person, and Jesus is obviously the wisdom of God. Yeah. So the Bible has a habit of doing that, taking things and actually saying, no, it's actually all about Jesus. And also, does it make... Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong here, but does it also make wisdom uh, female as well? Often, yeah. Often, yeah. So there you are, ladies. It's uh, the guys that are a bit lacking in the wisdom, isn't it, Jack, sometimes? <laughs> Evening, Mark and Jack. It's lovely to see you both. We look forward to your show every week. We love you both. Oh, isn't that lovely? Bless you, Jack. Thank you for coming and, getting, and get a good night's sleep. In Matthew 5, 14 to 15, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light under a blanket. Instead, put it on a stand and let it shine for all. So as Christians, we are also the light. We really need to shine in this darkness. Um, this is from the New Believers Bible. I also have a King James uh, Bible too. I don't, I've never heard of the New Believers Bible, Jack. You heard that one? No, actually. No, the New Believers. Right, there you go, the New Believers. God bless you both and everyone at Rev. Good stuff. Time is flying, Jack. Uh, Cynthia, John 9.5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I always think this is amazing, as God have us light through the stars, the sun and the moon. My oldest son lives in Suffolk, surrounded by farmland, and there are no artificial lights. When I've been down there, it's amazing looking at the stars. God's creation astounds me every day, and we are so blessed through all of our sins. Uh, he forgives us. Beautiful, isn't it, Jack? And the heavens declare the glory of God. They do, don't they? I love looking at the sky. They do. Not, no point looking up there tonight because it's a bit dodgy out there. Mind you, we're down here, so you might be having a, a much better day. Right, Jacko, point four. What do you reckon? Yeah, the next point is that often in the scriptures, light means life. And it doesn't always. Sometimes it's talking about truth. Sometimes it's talking about holiness. Sometimes it's talking about life. But really you see actually these ideas are mixed together. You can't fully separate them. It's like the Trinity. You know, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit are distinct individuals, but they're so united that you can't fully separate them either. And in John chapter 1, verse 4, it's talking about Jesus, the Word, and it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Yeah. So he's equating light and life. And it says that Jesus is the true light, which gives light to everyone, who was coming into the world. And it says, gives light to everyone, and I think it's Jesus that upholds the world and sustains life. And if it wasn't for Jesus, we, no one would exist. I'm not talking about just believers, I'm talking about on a physical level, he gives us life. He is the creator, ultimately. By him, all things were made, 
and without him nothing was made that, that was made. So Jesus is the creator. But for believers, it goes further. Jesus says in John 10 verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And yes, Jesus came to expose our sin and he is the light that exposes our sin. But the purpose of that is to bring life. God wants us to have abundant life. And he's not a party pooper. If you love sin, he's a party pooper because he, he doesn't want you to sin. And John even writes an epistle and he says, I'm writing this that you may not sin. But if you love righteousness and if you love the truth, then you'll love God because God is righteous and God is the truth. Um, so yeah, God wants us to have abundant life. And even now on earth, that's why we don't need to be miserable. In these passages, often Jesus says, you know, I've come that you may have joy. Yeah. And often in those passages, he talks about, you know, um, in the world there'll be tribulation and the world will hate you because you hated me, yet you can have joy. So God wants us to have joy and wants us to have light. But what is that life? Well, in John 17, verse 3, and he says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So to know life and to have life is to know God the Father and God the Son, who was sent by the Father. That's eternal life. It's about relationship. It's not eternal existence. Everyone will exist forever. You know, some will be in the lake of fire, but some will be in the new creation with God forever, having a deep relationship with him. Not a surface level relationship. We won't be acquaintances with God. Yeah. Jesus prays that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And he prays that we would share in the glory that Jesus shared with the Father. So he's completely inviting us in to have fellowship with God complete, perfect fellowship. And John 3.16, I love this verse. I know you all know it, but I'm going to read it anyway. Never heard of this one. <laughs> <laughs> it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. They're the two options. You either perish or you have eternal life. That is why Jesus came into the world. He said, I've not come to condemn the world, but that for me the world might be saved. He wants to save us, give us life, enable us to have a relationship with God, both now and forever. And I love how God's promises are now and forever. It's like in Psalm 23, surely the goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So we're not just waiting, getting through this life, thinking, right, this is rubbish, Jesus just come. And we do pray that Jesus will come, the spirit and the bride say come in Revelation, but we can have life now and we can know God now. It's interesting, Jay, that John 17, 3, um, Jeremy introduced me to that many, many years ago, that eternal life is knowing God. Um, and as we drove here towards the studio tonight, it's obviously wet and windy out there. And uh, as we got nearer and nearer to the studio, I had a real sense of, I had a real sense of evil um, out there. You know, obviously it's dark and windy and blowy and the trees are blowing and the leaves are blowing, but everywhere was deserted. And I said to you, isn't it amazing? It feels horrible out there. It feels dark and depressive and et cetera, et cetera. But for the Christian, actually, it doesn't have to be whatsoever because we are, we are still reminded we're, we're looking for a heavenly city. We're looking for the new Jerusalem. This isn't it. This, we are transient beings. We are pilgrims passing through this. But can you imagine? I actually said to you, Jack, as we come, can you imagine you know, if you believe in evolution? Uh, and this is it, this is your lot, whatever you're doing tonight, sitting in a one bedroom flat on your own, whatever you're doing. Uh, I'm talking about people that don't have God. I'd be depressed as well. Oh, this is it. Okay, so I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for this miracle vaccine, which was going to give me a reason to live next year, you know, so that's great, bloody, bloody, blah, blah. But oh, what if I don't get the vaccine quick enough? And everything in your life as a, an unbeliever is just predicated on something better coming around the corner, isn't it, Jack? You, you must, you, you need to have that. We've got our something better in our hearts and our minds, which, what a gift that is, Jack. You know, that you can, you can strip a Christian bear of his church, of his Bible in many, in many places around the world, you know, and by the way, folks, it's coming here, it is on the way. So we need to get this word, Jack, in our hearts and into our minds, yeah. commit it to memory. Because, you know, you often, you were like a bit of Richard Wormbrand, and you, you saw the film. That man in Christ was unbreakable. 
Yeah. You know? And he had such fellowship with God oh. even in his cell. Yeah. You know, people think, oh, it just must have been horrible all the time, and he was being tortured. That obviously was horrible. But he said it was like streams of living water. Wow. He had such fellowship with God. And he didn't have a Bible with him, but it was written on his heart. That reminds you of the verse in Psalm 119, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Amen. And there is another verse in Psalm 119, which you've set me up for nicely. Verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I went on a walk the other day and it was really dark because it gets dark so early now. And I'm used to running in the evenings. It was pitch black and I'm, run, I'm walking just next to some woods and you just feel slightly uncomfortable. And then I heard a thump and I thought, right, let's start moving quick. I, pull, <laughs> I pause my music just so I can hear anything and start walking quicker to get out. But um, it just reminded me of life without God. They're walking in darkness. We've seen a great light and we have the word which shows us both how to walk, the path, and it shows us where we're headed as well, heaven, the heavenly city. So we are really blessed. God's not left us just, okay, I've saved you, you now try and work out how to live. No, he's told us. We've got to walk in that light, haven't we? He's made it clear. And it says in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus speaking, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So we won't be like me the other day, walking in the darkness, hearing noises, hearing the thump and thinking, OK, I don't know where I am. Can't see where I'm going, barely. No, we will see where we're going. It's, it's like the relief when you're in the pitch black and you're not feeling comfortable and someone turns the light on and you say, finally. Yeah. And all, all those fears just immediately go away. You can see where you are and you're much more comfortable. And it is the same with Jesus. He shows us both the path and the destination. Yeah. And he also says, the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. So that's the contrast. The unsaved, those who've rejected Christ, don't know where they're going, which ultimately is hell. And that's why we shouldn't have a private faith, because we don't want them to go to hell. We want them to be saved, because God wants them to be saved. So that's why we've got to let our lights shine. Let it shine. Talking of um, people that might be unsaved, uh, Zoe says, uh, it's, it's a slightly different subject, but thank you for this, Zoe. Uh, hopefully this will help you and other people. Hey, chaps, what scripture can I send to my saved son who has moved in with his unbelieving girlfriend? And that's from Zoe. Zoe, the first one that popped straight in my mind was 2 Corinthians 6, 14 about, um, what is it, Jack? About having fellowship with darkness, basically, about being unequally yoked. So 2 Corinthians 6, 14 onwards, Zoe, and I hope that is some sort of help for you. And you know, the next verses I was going to say actually would be perfect for that, so I'll quickly yeah, just read yeah. a couple. Yeah, go for it. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, it says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, sin, we lie and do not practice the truth. And in John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That would probably be the perfect one to say, because I don't know whether they're a Christian or not. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Mm. It's like if, if you're married to someone and you go around cheating on them and your wife's saying, why are you doing this to me? You wouldn't say, oh, no, I do love you. I just, I just don't want to honour you at all. No, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So walk in the light, and that is the way to have fellowship with God. Beautiful. Thanks, Jack. Um, OK, many years ago, sailors needed the stars to navigate. That's God's light. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can't imagine navigating by the stars, Jack. That must be... Sounds like old bird to me. Give me a map and compass any day, walking around the middle of Dartmoor. Um, OK, um, made me smile. Didn't think much of you before, but Brill tonight. Brill, on fire. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> That'll keep you humble, but... That will, will it? <laughs> Lots of love, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. That's made my night, that one. <laughs> um, Mark, I'm nearly 80 and I'm still learning and I think we always will be till he calls us home to be with him. Wow, Cynthia, that's... That's quite, that's quite encouraging, that, you know, because sometimes you're like, I'm 51, I'm 29 years behind. 
but sometimes you think oh, I've hardly come anywhere, you know, I've hardly, I've hardly progressed whatsoever, you know, and that's that's the enemy yeah. trying to condemn you. That's that's not the Lord, you know. Well, before Noah, they lived for hundreds of years. Like yeah. They used to live into 969, and even they didn't reach perfection. Yeah. So you're young compared to them. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> keep going. Oh, keep going, keep going, Cynthia. Great stuff. Um, right. Evening, Mark and Jack. Thanks so much for sharing such inspirational truths. Quite the antithesis of the mainstream media. You started, Mark, by referring to these dark times, which undoubtedly are and are getting even darker as we approach the tribulation hour. The good news is that the gospel truth and the light of his Holy Spirit working through us will cause us to shine even more obviously to the children of darkness. Yeah, we, we will stand out even more. Who will have the choice of either repenting and turning to Jesus as Lord or alternatively to run and hide. Reference. Um, all, and this is a quote from Francis of Assisi, all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. And amazing that. You, in a dark room, Jack, just check out how much one candle gives off. Mm. It's, quite, it's quite amazing. And um, C.S. Lewis, do you know what? So, so he, this bloke is so profound, isn't he, that sometimes you read his books and you just read a whole page and he's, he's bamboozled you so much by in-depth thinking that you have to keep read the page again. He said, don't shine so that others can see you. Shine so that through you, others can see him. Mm. I love that. Absolutely. Do you know what? I know it's on a completely off note, but me and your mum, we had a little, um, for our birthday present, I think it was my birthday present, um, I think Grandad bought us a little night, night away somewhere in Buckinghamshire, and it was really lovely. Um, we was walking around Buckinghamshire, and I'm sure C.S. Lewis is buried. We went to visit Pastor Derek Walker and his lovely wife Hilary on the Saturday. And I'm sure that C.S. Lewis, it just popped in my head, is buried somewhere in Oxfordshire. Is that true? Because I really fancy going to see his grave. Quite possibly, because he, he taught at Oxford. He taught there, didn't he? But me and Mum went to visit a little church. We went to visit Coombe Hill, uh, somewhere near Aylesbury, which is a high point up there. And um, when we came down, we just saw this little old church sitting there, Jack, and we thought, oh, I wonder what this is all about, you know? Most churches all look the same, don't they? But Mum quickly got out the old Google, had a little reference check, and it was a... I forgot the village out there that it's, it's called, but it was a favourite church of all British Prime Ministers when they go and have a retreat at Chequers, which is like the Prime Ministerial house. Um, and most of them go there to pray. And Margaret Thatcher was there in 1982, regularly praying in the Falklands conflict. And it was just amazing just to be thinking that, you know, you're walking in the same paths as some of these people yeah. that have walked before. I must be getting older. I'm starting to get into history now. I'm getting old, guys, 51. Evening, so lovely to listen to you share the word and elaborate upon it, especially in these days. I'm finding the faithfulness and compassion of God, something I'm so thankful for. Wow, Karen, especially the faithfulness, absolutely. And I share with those words, God leads me to his strength we need. Bless you from Karen. Thank you, Karen, faithfulness and compassion. We need them, Jack, we need them. And the light has the victory is your final part, isn't it? Yeah, I'm right. glad you brought that up because this is such an important point. Okay, good. And in John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And you've got to bear in mind, before Jesus, there was 4,000 years of human history where Satan had been trying to destroy Israel, to destroy God's plans. He started in the garden, and it, it looked like he might have the victory. Sin comes into the world, but actually, God's always been in control and the victory is his. And Jesus came as a light, and he has the victory. And we also read that the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. So God's light is here. It's in a dark world, but the light is shining. It's not completely pitch black. And just for sake of time, I'll read um, Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And that comes right at the end of the Great Tribulation where the angels announce that this is now God's kingdom and he basically destroys Satan, throws him into the abyss for a thousand years. He destroys all the people that have come against Israel and he has the victory. He sets up his kingdom. So you might often feel like you're losing now yeah. and you might feel like the whole world's against you and you might feel like there's no righteous leaders in the world, and you might feel like the church is falling apart, but we already know the outcome. You know, when we read through our Bibles, we already know how it ends. Jesus has the victory. He shall reign forever and ever. It's not Satan. It's none of the false gods. 
It's Jesus who reigns forever and ever. So we're on the side of victory. We can know victory now, but the ultimate victory will be when Jesus returns. And in 1 John 5 verse 4, it says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. If you're born again, if you're a Christian, you've overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Jesus won the victory for us at the cross. How can we participate in it, be a part in it, receive this victory simply by faith? Yeah. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to be a good person for it because we're not good people. We believe and we receive God's goodness, God's blessings, and we will partake in his victory and reign with him as well. Lovely. Ephesians 2, 8, by grace through faith. Absolutely. As Jeremy says, Galatians somewhere, faith working through love. There's that compassion that Karen just mentioned, love. It's all in a jacket. It's all, in, in, it's all entwined, isn't it? Brilliant stuff. Um, the book you mentioned, Jack, even in Mark and Jack, I love your program. Thanks for all you do. I'd recommend the little book you mentioned to everyone, Jack. Um, I read it some time ago. I found it very helpful. Thanks and God bless from Sheila in Ireland. And I was wondering who it was. It is Tim Keller, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Did you give me that on holiday? It was in Cornwall somewhere, weren't we? Yeah. I was and on I, a beach somewhere, and you said, yeah, have a read of that, Jack. Okay. I read it when I was going to Germany on my year abroad, and I was literally just waiting for my plane. It took me about 45 minutes. So it's not a long read, but it was really good, actually. So I highly recommend. Oh, fan fantastic stuff. Right. Um, oh, sorry to repeat my age, nearly 80, uh, but I need Jack to make some CDs. There we go, Jack. You're into the CD-making uh, situation here. It reminds me so much of my eldest grandson, as he is 18 and into the word like Jack, but he is blessed like Jack. He has solid Christian parents like his youngest brother and sister who sing in the praise and worship team. And even on our church, virtual church on Sundays, they are able to sing, God sees our hearts, not our possessions. Wow. Mm. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Um, I haven't got time to address it because it's, uh, but the person that signed themselves off, B, um, Oh, I, I did a God morning about this exact situation about when we're not healed. And, you, and you're just, I'm not going to address it now because it's, it's I, I would need longer than three minutes and we're down to three minutes and, and two minutes exactly. Thank you, Luke. Um, people that don't get healed, you're, you're quoting someone that says, if you don't get healed, you're lacking faith. Stick that thought in the bin, all right? Stick that thought in the bin. A lack of healing does not indicate a lack of faith. Far, far from it. Isaiah 53 is very clear that physical healing is ultimately in the atonement, but your main thing that you are healed from is your spiritual separation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the Lord can and does heal. Yes, he can and do, does do miracles. But in the end, we all die. And, uh, you know, every single person that was healed in the Bible all died in the end. But the main thing they were healed of was their spiritual separation from God. Do not let any preacher in a book, telly or CD let you think that your lack of faith is the reason for your lack of healing. That, that is straight from the pit of hell, bin it. And I don't want to name the person who you got that from, but it is shocking and it is outrageous. Jack, down to our last minute and bit. Um, Frankie, Belfast, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Jack, we're down to our last 50 seconds. Uh, the topics are all coming in. Jack, thanks for being there this week. Another little great little subject, really enjoyed it. Thank you for all your preparation. You do a good little job, mate. You really, really do. Thank you so, so much. Hope to have you back next week. Hopefully I'll be here. Really hope so. So we'll start talking about our little subjects on the way home. All right, mate? And uh, she'll be really, really good. So thanks for the cup of tea yesterday. You really restored my faith in the light. We're down to our last 20 seconds. Guys, I've loved it. It's a real honour and a privilege to be in your living rooms each week with my son, uh, but mainly with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. As Karen reminds us, reminds us he's full of compassion, faithfulness. We'll see you next week. By the grace of God, keep looking up. Your redemption draws nigh.